Um, so this is a, a kickoff to um, Resilient Rural's webinar series about food sovereignty. I'm really excited to share the space with uh, my co-host, Derek Bruno, um, and also Marsha Schack with Young Agrarians and Renee McLeck with uh, Common Ground Garden Project of uh, Rethink Red Deer. Um, my name is, is Jill Yench. I work with um, the town of Bruderheim and I'm the director of Resilient Rurals. Um, so just to, to start us off, um, I wanna do um, a land acknowledgement. So um, our team, the Resilient Rurals team, uh, reside in both Treaty 6 and Treaty 7 territories. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge the, the First Nations and the Métis Nations of those lands. Um, and when it comes to land and reconciliation, um, from my own personal perspective, um, I grew up on a farm about a half an hour outside of Edmonton, um, and, and that allowed me to grow a very strong connection to the land and also a very strong sense of the First Nation peoples that belong to that land. Um, so that is what has inspired me and driven me um, to the work that I do in the environmental field um, and with municipalities and with the powerful Indigenous communities that I have the privilege of, of working with. Um, and that privilege comes through my collaboration with Derek Bruno, um, my, my co-host for today. Um, Derek is, is with, uh, he's the managing partner of Subgen Consulting um, from Samsung Free Nation. Um, I'll let him introduce himself um, in a moment, again, but um, he's known across Canada um, as an incredible visionary um, and speaker and a doer um, in the community economic development field and, and food sovereignty space. So um, just some housekeeping. If you have any questions, please pop those into the chat and, and we'll be watching for those. Um, I also want to recognize my staff, um, Danielle Houck and Christina Fung, um, for all the work that they do with Resilient Rurals. I'm super grateful um, to have them. They're, they're really amazing um, colleagues in this space. Um, so just a, a very brief introduction to what Resilient Rurals is. So we began as a, a partnership between the towns of Bruderheim, Gibbons, and Lamont. Um, working on climate change adaptation and resilience project um, in Alberta's industrial heartland. And so our purpose is um, to develop a model for, for small towns created by small towns um, and to really get a sense of what climate adaptation looks like for small and rural communities. Um, we've recently started up some food sovereignty work in collaboration with Derek. Um, with a, a, a focus on bringing together Indigenous and non-Indigenous partners and creating opportunities to learn um, from the many contributors in this space. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, and we, we can dive into it now. So I'm going to hand it off to um, Derek to introduce himself and, um, and his connection um, with one of our speakers here. Thank you so much. Hi, hi. It's truly a beautiful day. It's great to see all your beautiful faces. Uh, even those of you who do not have your cameras on, I'm sure you are just as beautiful as everybody else. Um, I uh, thank you, uh, Jill, for uh, for for the introduction. Uh, I'm I'm one of those types where I like introducing myself because the bios always have a tendency to kind of go off and uh, create expectation. And I often say, I'll create my own expectation just to say that I humbly serve the people uh, of, of Treaty 6, 7, and 8. Um, actually, uh, we, we also work nationally with, with communities bridging gaps, bridging knowledge, brid bridging people. Um, and and uh, so I've been very blessed to work in that space. Um, because we have uh, two amazing speakers lined up, I really want this to be an interactive session with, uh, with each and every one of you. So we'll, we'll jump into the sessions. Uh, so our first speaker, uh, Marsha, I'm going to get you to introduce yourself. And I just sort of will um, say that Marsha and I have been working together for, for a number of years. Uh, Marsha's worked all over the world. And, and I love what she has to say about my community of Samson Cree Nation working there. Um, so, uh, and, and, you know, and, and I credit Marsha for really uh, being the person to bring me back to the land. Um, our elders would often talk about our connection to the land, getting back to the land, 
And if it was through an unlikely connection with Marsha that I really, she helped me sort of see how to do that through permaculture. And uh, so I'm forever grateful for that and hence why I'm here today. So Marsha, uh, with no further ado, let's get into your presentation. Looking forward to hearing all the great things that you're doing. And uh, as, as Jill said, if you have any questions, everybody, um, you know, this is for you guys. So let's, let's ask Marsha lots of questions. So Marsha, I'll hand it to you. Thanks, Derek. That was such an amazing uh, piece of praise that you gave me there because, you know, I, um, we, we did first connect over permaculture and I was actually in a, uh, a conversation this week uh, from, with another uh, settler educator who works in Muskeg Lake Cree Nation in Saskatchewan. And he was talking about how permaculture helped him see through an indigenous worldview. And that's really what I feel like permaculture has done for me. And then to be able to like hand that over to you with the relationship that we have, I think is just like, is so uh, interesting and beautiful. And that's actually the thing that ties like the three of us here together, Derek, Renee, and I actually have kind of been like mixing our relationships and our networks together for what now mm, over almost a decade uh, and all around this, uh, this concept of permaculture and coming back to the land. So uh, thank you, Derek. Uh, I'm coming to you here today from uh, Yellowhead County, just nestled actually just down the road from where Derek and Jill are here today, just outside of Edson, halfway between Jasper and Edmonton. And I have the uh, privilege of living on about 30 acres of very clay soil, which I look out at my window every morning and decide or think about what am I going to do with this space uh, here that's in front of me. Um, yeah, so I have that privilege of being able to do that. And I was thinking of, and I invited, when I, Derek first invited me to come on and speak with this webinar today, I was actually sitting in the office of my good friend, Renee Michalak, who's also on the call here with us today. Uh, we were talking about his project, the Common Ground Project. And I started reflecting on how Renee and I actually um, crossed paths in our lives too. And I want to say, I think it was in 2000 and. 16, we both worked on Alberta Food Matters together, which was a offshoot of growing food security, Alberta. Right, Renee? Is that what the, you can turn your mic on. We can turn this into a conversation. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't notice that. Yeah, I think so. That, that sounds right. That sounds like the touch point. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, and just for the audience sake, Renee, can you give us like a one-liner of what the Growing Food Security Network in Alberta was and how it started? Yeah, um, so Susan Roberts, longtime uh, dietitian, initiated it with some other colleagues of hers uh, through the Dietitians of Canada, I believe, and it was intended to work with rural communities on the topic of food security and food sovereignty. And I think at the time, the federal uh, initiative was happening, uh, the People's Food Policy Project. So they were hosting kitchen table talks, and that's how they were engaging these communities to start to build their literacy and awareness of what food security and food sovereignty are, and how to creatively respond to minimizing and maximizing respectfully, uh, respectively, those two issues. So yeah, in a nutshell. Yeah, cool. And then it grew into this like really uh, kind of like formal organization, Alberta Food Matters, who then went on to like kind of try and create this network or support this network across Canada of people or sorry, across Alberta uh, who were engaged in uh, food or food sovereignty or food security at all different levels from producers all the way up to food banks and social services and those sorts of things. Yeah. And then. Um, yeah, and so then, and then Derek and Renee first met each other. I'm going somewhere with painting this relationship, so just bear with me. So then Derek and and Renee met each other. Actually, when Derek and I first started working together, I showed him my composting worms, and he was so fascinated with them that we scooped up his girls and took them to uh, Renee's house and showed the girls and Derek this giant worm composting bin. Uh, and I think we even watched a video on how worms ate, ate all and, and turned into soil, which is good foreshadowing for the for your conversation later, Renee, because you're going to take us in, into nerding out about soil. Yeah. So yeah, so lots of crossover and lots of net and lots of networking um, over the past decade. And one of the reasons why I like to highlight this, these kind of relationships that exist between each of us on the call is because 
it ties right into the work that I currently do uh, with Young Agrarians, uh, which is a farmer to farmer network that, act that connects uh, each uh, farmers with each other so that they can actually learn skills uh, in farming from startup first year all the way up until, you know, we have people who are looking at succession planning. Uh, with their farm. So I'm going to pop up a beautiful photo um, of the people in our network. But just before we do that, actually, Renee, did you want to say anything else about yourself before uh, I pop this up for people? Um, just a long time Red Deer resident since 1986 and have uh, been taking my own journey through permaculture and reaffirming my relationship with the land and, you know, the, the natural ecology, and then using that as a really great way to uh, tell stories and engage people and, you know, share experiences and, and helping others do the same. So really happy to be on the webinar today and, and look forward to getting to know everybody and uh, definitely want it to be interactive. So ask questions because this is the first time I've given this presentation fresh from the field as of this growing season. So definitely feel like you can uh, interrupt me and, and ask questions if you have them. So back to you, Marcia. Yeah, for sure. Actually, here's a good question. Just by a show of hands, how many of you are aware of what permaculture is? Okay. And those people without the screens are without, we can't see their faces. So we're just going to assume that there's enough knowledge in the room of people who uh, know what permaculture is. All right. Um, so Renee, thank you for that. And Renee, your picture isn't here in this uh, in this picture of our beautiful network. However, you are part of our beautiful network. Um, so like I said, uh, Young Agrarians is a network of farmer to farmer uh, support. And we're actually one of the largest education resource networks for new and young farmers in Canada. Uh, so we have programming in Western Canada. So from Manitoba out into BC, but our network actually stretches all the way across the country. And it started back in 2012 when really we were starting to see uh, a real decline in the population that are farming and our farm operators. So this is the problem that we're trying to address by having this Young Agrarians Network is that we're seeing a sharp decrease in the amount of the population that are farming and also the people who are under the age of 35 and younger who are farming is also continuing to decrease. Marcia. Probably not surprising. Yes, Jill. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, I do have someone um, asking in the chat, just if you could please give a quick definition of, of permaculture. Oh, 100%. Um, so permaculture is a framework that's built upon three ethics, which is earth care, people care, and future care. And there, it's a holistic design science framework that you can use to create gardens and habitats and fuel and fiber and basically all of your needs um, as a human in a way that um, gives back to the earth and also gives back to humans as well. So how'd I do, Renee? Great. <laughs> Great. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, at the end, we can pop some resources in the chat for you too. So yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so thinking about so thinking about our farmers as you know providers of all of our fuel and our fiber and the things that we need uh, to live on the earth, we have a, see a real challenge in the cost of land in production for young people even getting into farming. So this is one of the challenges that we're trying to work with as well through our programs. Um, so we support new farmers with access to education, training, land, business mentorship, resources, and capital. And how I kind of fit into those program goals is I'm the coordinator of the apprenticeship program and for both Alberta and BC. And so we actually match young people with host mentor farmers uh, who want to, for young people who want to learn skills in farming and um, mentor farmers who want to teach those skills. I'm kind of like the matchmaker and uh, help them find spaces on farms to be able to do that. So in 2022, we've worked with a lot of people, uh, a lot of landholders and a lot of organizations, including Renee's organization, Rethink Red Deer, uh, which we're gonna hear about here in a minute. And 
you know, we at, at YA, we have these program pillars where we're trying to think, really think about how can we grow the next generation of farmers, knowing that farmers grow other farmers. Okay? So we kind of have these five pillars. So we've got a lot of online um, online events and programs, including things like business boot camps, how to start farming, uh, soil workshops. We've got a cooperatives one that we just did last week about people getting into cooperatives. We do the apprenticeship training, which I spoke briefly about. Lots of educational events. Uh, in BC specifically, we have uh, land access and land matchers and people who help with land transition uh, for non-family succession as well. Currently, that's only a program we run in BC, but we're looking for long-term funding to bring that across the prairies. And then we also have a business mentorship program as well, which pairs people who are in their first to five, first to five years of farming with people who've been there a little bit longer to give them that mentorship piece around, uh, you know, especially around profits and loss and all those things. So, like I said, we're a farmer to farmer network. We really believe in the power of community and that the wisdom is in the room. So bringing people together, bringing farmers together and people who are interested in land and farm access is really important to us. And we're also multi-generational. As you can see in this photo, there's a baby uh, in the circle. And just this past weekend, we hosted a prairies mixer in Saskatoon, uh, where we had over 25 children that came as part of their, like as part of their families to the mixer. And it's just like such a different vibe, uh, bringing, you know, that multi-generational piece into conversations about food and farming and land access. So. Uh, we have a pretty strong online presence as well, um, most a lot on social media. We've got uh, a U map as well that shows our different um, uh, opportunities across the province and also the farmers in our network uh, in our networks as well. Uh, it's pretty active, and we've also got a pretty active blog as uh, where you can find information about like how to write a grant for your farm or like how to build soil for your for your garden or like how do you arrange dried flowers like we've got such a uh, an eclectic mix of people inside of our network that our blog also covers all of those kind of eclectic tastes of the people in our network too there's a picture of our u map where you can find land listings uh you can find markets you can find services and suppliers so i definitely encourage you to check that out as well and then here's just a brief overview of some of the things that we provide and kind of like the trajectory to try and carry people on. So starting with our e-learning platform, we've got this how to start farming, which is like the basic uh, understanding for maybe somebody who grew up in the city and is just like super farm curious, but has no idea where to start. And then after they kind of take that program, they can head into the apprenticeship program where you get that one-on-one -on -one, uh, interaction and the daily um, understanding of what it's like to be on a farm. After that, they can take our business boot camp. Maybe they get an idea for a farm enterprise. So then they can come in and we can help them work through that business boot camp. And we have a lot of mentors and other farmers that come into that business boot camp to host some of those webinars and workshops. And after that, once they're into you know their business and they're starting it, and away they go, we have the business mentorship network where we again pair people together to help each other. Uh, and support the, the business within the first to five years. So this is a slide from Saskatchewan, but I think it's fairly relevant to Alberta as well. You know, we're seeing this crazy uptake in uh, the price of land and also the percentage of farm operators in Saskatchewan under 35 just dropping off. And that statistic is fairly similar here in Alberta as well. Yeah. This 74% of farmers um, that say they'll sell their land in the next 10 years. My boss was saying yesterday <laughs> that she feels like she's been saying that statistic for like 10 years. So, you know, it is kind of, it is kind of interestingly stable in that sense, but we do know that there are a lot of farmers who are aging and a lot of families whose parent, whose kids have left the farm and gone to the city and they're not interested in coming back. Um, so they're looking for non-family succession uh, support. Um, Tara, is there an age cap on the Young Agrarians program? No, 
Young is a bit of a misnomer. We modeled the program after new agrarians in the United States. And so because that was already trademarked when we started in 2012, we couldn't have new agrarians and we also didn't want to step on their toes. So we went with Young. Um, often when we talk about the organization now, we just say YA because Young is anybody. Yeah, new, a new farmer can be anybody uh, who wants to get into farming. The only, uh, I guess, caveat on that would be is a lot of the grants that support farmers in hiring staff for the summer, like the Canada Jobs Grant or other um, things like streams like that, they do have a cap on age. Oftentimes it's 30 and under or 35 and under. So sometimes that does hinder us, although, you know, anybody in Anybody can be in our network. Anybody can be a young agrarian. Oh. <clears throat> Thanks for the question. All right, I'm just gonna flip through these next little things. So we talked about the land matching program. That one, we've, we've got 13 land matchers in BC. Uh, it's modeled off of a program out of Quebec where they actually have 40 land matchers uh, and a really robust uh, apprenticeship program as well. Uh, let's see, we've written some land access guides, uh, both one, one for Alberta and then also a BC family transition guide. The BC one is good even for the Prairie Provinces if you're interested in something like that. And the land access guide, you know, we would love to have some more funding to actually expand uh, <clears throat> that piece because that is the number one thing that people are talking about is access to land. There's lots of people who want to farm, but they don't have the actual space to do it in yet. And then lastly, just some of the policy things that we're involved in. Uh, we're working with the federal government for a new farmer entrance strategy for Canada. We currently don't have one. We did see some uh, good news from the current Alberta government that in the letter to the agricultural minister, there is actually direction for a new entrant strategy for Alberta and also looking at getting young people into agricultural jobs. So we are looking, are excited about that and are trying to work with the government to um, assist them in bringing that forward. Uh, you know, we, and so we're also looking at the fact that BC and Quebec already have new entrant strategies. Um, and that's actually what's helping scale up. That's the BC land matching program. So not, not only are we running programs Western Canada and into BC, but we're also thinking about expanding federally to try and find more supports for farmers across the uh, across the country. There's our really wicked logo. I love it. I was at uh, Olds College this couple of past little weeks at their um, career fair, and somebody came up to me and he's and he looks at the fist and he's like, "Are you guys freedom fighters?" And I was like, "Yeah." Freedom fighters for soil. <laughs> uh, and I guess that's what <laughs> the last kind of thing that I missed and maybe take for granted now that I've been in the organization for a while is that Young Agrarians is a network of ecological, regenerative, and organic or almost organic farmers. Uh, we really take seriously the that soil is the thing that feeds us. It's uh, something that we need to be caring for through cover crops and through the care or like stewardship through through grazing animals and other kind of uh, amendments in that way uh, and so you know it really becomes an inspiring place of hope to go to work every day knowing that you're trying to support people in uh, growing food and also regenerating the soil so so that's it for me um any questions or do we want to hold all the questions no, we can uh, we can tell you we have some time to for some questions now and uh, before we get into Renee's presentation. Uh, so <laughs> to hear from the group here on any thoughts or comments, questions. So, so while uh, you are generating your questions, I have a couple. Um, so you're talking about your land matching in, in BC. So it sounds like that's a very successful program. Um, it, it kind of makes me think about, um, a lot of the first nations in this country have uh, a lot of, uh, you know, fantastic land. And one of the things we hear from, from them is, um, is, is, uh, you know, 
trying to align with those individuals that have sort of, um, you know, like the organic farmers or regenerative farmers uh, wanting to create those connections. So um, it, have, do, you, do you find within the y, YA group that uh, you're getting more interest from First Nations to be jumping on board to connect with folks for exchange of ideas, exchange of, uh, you know, bring farmers onto the land? Because I'll, just for the group's um, uh, information, you know, right now, a lot of the land on the First Nation reserves are being farmed by outside farmers. And um, the reason is because um, on the reserve, there's a unique situation caused by the Indian Act. And the Indian Act prevents farmers or entrepreneurs from using any assets as security to, to, to fuel their uh, farms. And so that naturally that's next to impossible to, to have a farm if that's the case. So we end up leasing the land to outside farmers. And so Marsha, just to that point, are you seeing more connections in that space? Uh, I would say yes, mm. we are seeing more connections in that space. And the most recent connection um, I can draw to is like, so we just did our Prairies Mixer in Saskatoon last week, which is like our version of a conference. And there I met a woman named Amy Sequoias, and she is part of the Treaty Land Sharing Network. And so what they're actually doing is working with farmers to create safe spaces for Indigenous people on farmers' lands. So, and one of the ways they do that is by creating the relationship between the farmer, between the uh, Indigenous people who are wanting to access that land for, for traditional hunting or gathering or ceremonial purposes. And uh, it starts actually with them coming together and having a meal together and discussing that would, would look like. And then it is um, at putting up signs actually around the property saying that this space is safe for Indigenous users to come and use. So we are seeing Indigenous groups reaching out to, um, uh, to young agrarians looking for more support in doing that. And then the other thing that really popped into my head too, as you were talking, is like the National Farmers Union, uh, who we were affiliated with, but uh, and is also working towards um, farmers' rights within legislation and policy, uh, especially around you know wages and things like that. One of the things I think that might shock people is that in Alberta, you don't have to pay farm workers minimum wage. There's labor laws that you can actually work your your work your way around that, which is crazy. Anyway, I'm going off on a tangent. They just they just <laughs> released a video about Kaunas First Nations in Saskatchewan who have actually taken back all of their land from non-Indigenous farmers and turned it into an organic uh, grain farm. And it's really beautiful. It's out uh, on the NFU website right now. I can find that link for you. So there's definitely something bubbling. And we feel really honored to be at that intersection of um, conversations about land and land access. So the Treaty Land Sharing Network is expanding into Alberta. They have a working group here right now and they're looking at uh, doing a, a launch in July. Um, if you're interested, maybe what we can do, uh, Jill, is if you could just take a note of the things for links that I can send afterwards, like Treaty Share Land Sharing Networks and things like that, that would be great. Cause I can Absolutely. put you in touch with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, do, do. I see Let. Danielle has her hand up. For sure. Let's go to Danielle. Cool. Before I ask my question in the chat, we do have a question just about how the land matching aspect of young YA works. Uh, if you could talk to that for a bit. Yeah. So you're going to have to forgive me because I know a little bit, but not a lot. Um, so I do know that BC is divided up into bioregions. Each of the bioregion has a land matcher and their job is to work with people who might have an idea for a farm and, or even maybe have a business on a farm business on land that they're currently leasing and are looking for a situation where they can actually come and start their farm enterprise on somebody else's property. So the land matcher is part paralegal part conflict negotiator, part matchmaker, um, and they work with the farmer and the landholder to create lease agreements uh, between them. It's a, it's a super popular 
program in BC. It's actually funded by the BC government and Young Agrarians administers it on behalf of the government. Uh, we would love to see something like that in the prairies <laughs> because and because uh, it's definitely something that people are talking about. So yeah, any other questions about the land matching? Tara. What is the barrier um, to it coming into Alberta? Is it just no momentum yet? Or are there is there issues with just buy-in from people or? I would say that the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And so we need more people telling the government that this is what we want. In the 70s and 80s, there was a real strong voice for new farmers and for land access in Alberta, and then it kind of just fizzled out. So the, the it's, yeah, this is the first time in a long time we've even seen agricultural minister talk about new farm entrance and land access. So we just, yeah, we just need more people talking about it. Mm hmm mm hmm Okay, is there any, any oh, other so, questions? Uh, yeah, Danielle still has a hand up. I'll hop in with oh. my question. Um, oh, because you have so many different aspects of farmers, so many different scales, so many different goals, ultimately, I was wondering, based on like your different conferences or speaker series, how does all this diversity that you have in your network does it lead to a lot of innovation in those conversations? Like how does it work if somebody comes in with a more traditional farming idea and then somebody comes in wanting to do, you know, something in the city or, you know, just I'm curious about the benefits of that diversity you've collected. Hmm. The benefits of the diversity that we've collected. Well, I would say that that's a good question, Danielle. My brain's going in a bunch of different directions. And I want to make sure that I understand your question clearly too. Is like just is it more of a question of just like how do we balance if somebody came into the business boot camp and one person wants to do like sheep and another person wants to grow canola <laughs> a little bit that a little bit if somebody wants to come in with that permaculture background versus somebody coming in with that traditional farming background I mean in uh, my experience I find as long as it's a space where people are comfortable learning from one another that diversity is really important um, and it seems like that's that kind of space for you and I was wondering kind of if there had ever been an instance where all these diverse perspectives come together and maybe one person comes in with one idea of what they're going to do and they leave with a totally different one. Um. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that we, so diversity is always welcome in our room and we really appreciate people coming in with different perspectives. And I think the thing that makes us kind of unique as an organization is anytime we start any of our conversations uh, in our network or even in our online webinars as well, we start with community agreements where we actually say, where we actually say very clearly and succinctly, you are here to learn and to be curious about it and what it take what take what works for you and leave behind what doesn't. And we actually really encourage people to come into the room with diversity because diversity is actually what cross pollinates and what makes um, ideas better. It's actually one of the principles of permaculture is uh, creatively, what is it Renee, creatively use? Use diversity, but yeah. Yeah, yeah to use diversity and to use creativity. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what, one of our apprentices, so I'll tell you our superstore, superstar story. So if we could have this story in Young Agrarians put over and over and over again, this would be like mwah, French kiss. Okay, or chef's kiss, that's what that's called. <laughs> um, so we have a, a, a farmer in our network she started as an apprentice on a farm up near Gibbons about two seasons ago. She did her first year apprenticeship, no farming background, has a musical background, but is an artist and likes um, creating things with her hands. 
goes up to the farm, spends two seasons there as an apprentice, first learning, second season, she starts her own enterprise on that farm. Okay. Then she moves back to the Edmonton area, leases land to start her, her farm. She thinks she's going to start growing vegetables. That's what she starts with for the first three years, growing vegetables for a CSA box. She starts leasing land east of Edmonton and quickly decides that she actually prefers to grow flowers and not only that, dried teas and also dried flower arrangements. So then she goes into the business boot camp and creates her business plan for Busy Bee Florals. Her name's jo and this is her name is Josephine, and then and then she goes to a business boot camp, goes back, leases another year of land, then her and her husband buy some land an hour east of Edmonton, and she moves her business to that land. And this year, she's taking on an apprentice in our program. And I highlight that story because in the beginning, Josephine went to a mixed farm operation where there was vegetables and animals. She swore that she was going to raise sheep and grow vegetables. Five years later, she's growing flor dried florals and teas uh, on land that she was able to just purchase after leasing for the first four years of her business. So, and she wouldn't have been able to do that without the people that she would have met along the way in the network. That's something that we really focus on on YA is like is really supporting the connecting and the building and the bridge building between farmers so that they can find their niche because there's room for everybody. There's room for more farmers and there's room for more people and their diversity. Yeah. Thank you so much, Marcia. I, I feel like I'm still absorbing um, the details. I have a, a couple questions. Mm -hmm. um, one is, is tied to that um, stat that you gave, the 74% of farmers um, selling their land in the next 10 years, and also that, um, you know, that access to land is the number one thing that people are talking about. Um, so my personal um, situation is my, my parents have a farm and it's, it's um, you know, the commodity-based canola, barley, that kind of thing. Um, and it's a small farm. Um, and it's something that I would like to take over, um, but there's a lot of barriers there. Um, and so that that succession planning piece um, is important um, for us. My son also, he he goes and he works on the farm and, and it's really, you know, looking at what he can do with those, those skills. Um, if taking over the farm or managing it um, in the current way is not an option, which it isn't. Um, so I'm just wondering if you can speak to because you you touched on that you have that like a family transition guide um, and that there is some that that non-family succession support and what does that succession piece look like um, like what what kind of resources and supports are are available? Yeah. Mm, good question. So I do know that there are people uh, like my call. Like my colleague, sorry, I've got two dogs here that are like looking at me. Uh, <laughs> um, so there are people who work specifically in succession, non-family succession planning with farmers. Uh, and I can give you some contact names and details to do that. That is not a realm of expertise I have at all, but it is a realm that people are working in to try and help that. Uh, the only thing Young Agrarians has available in this moment is that BC land transition guide. And there is a lot of really good tips in there, uh, even for people who are not, who might not be in BC. Uh, they're pretty general in terms of how to start doing that, um, for sure. And then because this like YA works as part of a network, I would start, like if I was to give a piece of advice to, to you and to your family or other people who are looking at that, is to start asking around and talking to other farmers too because you can't be the only ones who are in this situation who are asking about farm succession and just start having those conversations with your neighbors too um, because I think the more we can actually talk and share about the that this is actually a challenge that farmers are facing uh, in in across Canada and it actually impacts all of us all of us need to eat uh, right and all of us are connected to the to the farming community in some way the the more we can start developing what that non-farm transition uh, starts to look like because there are so many young people who want land so we just need to find the way to bridge that for people mm -hmm. 
we'll thank you for that. So I think making those connections is really great starts. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and then my other question is, it, I can see that you've built like a really strong and beautiful community um, with, with all of your members. Um, I'm wondering at community level, um, like collaboration with municipalities, is that something that that you encounter very much, or just because we are, you know, we have this this partnership with municipalities, and we're trying to identify what these things look like from that municipal space. So, just any thoughts or experiences that you have in collaboration with municipalities? Yeah, for sure. I think. The collaboration with our municipalities comes through our collaboration with our farmers. So we are a farmer to farmer network that tends to be where we focus uh, our attention and energy. But then when we do that, we also have municipalities that come as part of that ecosystem around food. Renee is going to talk a little bit about his relationship with the city of Red Deer around their project um, in a little bit. So kind of like... Um, a couple degrees of separation for municipalities because we have been so focused on the farmer to farmer piece, but we are starting to actually this year just dip our toes into some relationships with counties and because counties are actually interested in uh, the, much about the same um, concerns you're having, Jill, on your family farm, counties are seeing we've got multiple members in our county who are in a situation where they're looking for succession planning. How do we actually support a large number of farmers who are finding the same the same thing by bringing in uh, young agrarians programs and services, and so we're just just starting to tip our our tip tiptoe into that within the next last couple of months here. So, yeah, uh, yeah, young agrarians has grown quite rapidly over the last year. We've gone from about ten uh, staff members up to thirty. So we're also just a baby organization now trying to. Um, dip our toes into these larger waters, which is exciting. So that's mm. that's really great to hear. Thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. oh, and there's I see... no me there's no membership fee for YA. It's free to follow us on socials. Um, yeah, I guess the membership fee would be if you paid us to take one of our online e learning courses. But we have sliding scales and. Uh, and bursaries and things like that available for people. So mm -hmm. we are a nonprofit that uh, is supported by governments and foundations. So we try and make it as accessible as possible for people. Yeah, so please come follow us. We have a newsletter. Uh, we, have great, we have a great social media feed and uh, our website is full of really rich stuff too, so. Excellent. Well, Marsha, one final question. Uh, so do you guys have a business directory, directory for some of the farmers that, uh, a part of your group? 100%. Yep. That's our U map. So we can put yeah, the okay. link on the website there too. Uh, and you can find pretty much anything that you're looking for, anyone or anything you're looking for on that map. So mm -hmm. Marcia, it is always a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, if you guys, uh, you can't tell, but she's in her tiny house. So she's the real deal. Uh, she <laughs> has a res dog that she she saved from our community. So I just said, you know, that's just adds to it. So thank you. He's living the life of luxury now. Uh, thank you, Marsha. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's move into Renee. I will uh, uh, give the floor to you. And if there's any additional comments you want to add to your bio and your introduction, uh, you know, it's the floor is now yours. Right. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to work with Marsha on projects and initiatives and attend meetings together. So I'm really happy to be presenting to you all today with her at my side. And I'm just swapping back to the right tab. Forgive me for not having it up and ready. All right, share screen. Okay, it should be good. Can you all see that? Perfect. All right, can I just get a quick time check? How much uh, time we have left for the webinar? We have, we have 45 minutes left. Oh, good, okay. So again, my name is Renee Michalak. I am the project manager for the Common Ground Garden Project, which is under the watch of Rethink Red Deer. So Rethink Red Deer has been around since 2007 and always with the focus of helping people to become great citizens. Our founder, Lauren Daniel, was quoted as saying, great cities need great citizens. And I think specifically in our relationship with young agrarians, we have a history of hosting uh, youth as interns 
uh, over the years with our different projects and initiatives through Rethink Red Deer. And uh, I think we've had eight total to date, including a few that have now recently come from the Common Ground Garden Project, which is our most recent initiative. And this project started in about 2019 when our current chair, Art Van Zanten, was watching uh, soccer on YouTube and saw the uh, Planted Forward video in his upcoming video feed on the right. And so he uh, was inspired by that initiative and got in touch with our city. And the rest is history. And I'll kind of go into a little bit of detail here as to where we are and how that relationship evolved. But essentially, our, our mission and vision here, fostering sustainable food security, connecting to the land, sharing seeds of knowledge and growing an inclusive community. So very much fits under the rubric of Rethink Red Deer as the, as the parent organization. So we're located in downtown Red Deer in what's formerly known as the Cronquist Business Park, now being rebranded as the Capstone Area. And economic development through the city of Red Deer is responsible for that transition and promotion. And so they have a uh, phrase called live in capstone. And you can see it looks not too impressive. It's fairly, uh, you know, dusty looking and dirty looking, but that's an industrial area. It's former home of, uh, of uh, many of the civic yards now uh, that the city of Red Deer uh, populates down another location close to the river. But this one where we are, you can see in the red outline with the uh, the dash yellow line is the uh, former home of electric light and power for the city. So it's been sitting there as a brownfield site since those uh, civic yards have moved from this Cronquist Business Park down to the uh, river's edge, uh, a little bit to the, I would say, northeast, I guess, of, uh, of this location. Uh, however, there's still some nice gems there. As you can see, Troubled Monk Brewery is a nice uh, stop for us on those hotter days in the, uh, in the summertime as a uh, nice watering hole, and then our office uh, community located just a bit north of that. So with that brownfield site, the city uh, identified it as a potential project area for us to do this uh, common ground garden project, very similar to the Planted Forward Initiative in Houston, which was basically urban agriculture, community gardens, creating employment for newcomers to the community, uh, primarily um, um, immigrants. And so we uh, were inspired by that initiative. And so through I think a year and a half of consultations facilitated by social planning at the city. We came up with the concept of common ground and I'll now show you some slides as to what that's going to look like or what that currently looks like. So this is that uh, dash yellow line area as of this year. So from 2019 to 2023, we've been busy setting up these garden spaces. It all started with the concentric bale beds on the left. And we made our way to the right, evolving and adding as we had the uh, capacity and volunteers and the apprentices, of course, through Young Agrarians this year being the biggest help and uh, the squash mound with the uh, containers around it. And then the upper right corner, our medicine wheel garden, which is the most recent addition from our Indigenous apprentice, Megan, who I'll introduce you to shortly here. So that's a little more detailed map annotated here with what each particular area is. And the biggest addition I think we've had is our drip irrigation system. So that 5,000 liter tank in the upper left is actually connected to our bale bed growing areas. And the reason we're using bales is because the brownfield site has contaminated soil conditions. So to be sure that we're not putting any of the food in danger of being contaminated by pretty much mostly benign um, hydrocarbon um, fly ash they use for dust control. That's the biggest concern. Any other major concerns are behind that construction fence or currently being uh, reclaimed or repaired as we speak. So this drip irrigation system really lightened the load on not just our uh, volunteers, but our staff as well. So we basically turned the, the pump on and within an hour and a half, we watered essentially the entire site a good uh, uh, six inches down. Uh, and what we're doing next spring is adding to the squash mound where you see that thousand liter IBC tote in the center of all those circles. Uh, so this is kind of the current footprint that we're working with. And uh, part of that above ground growing uh, makes it twice as hard to manage. So we're really trying to walk that line between, you know, putting volunteers to work versus engaging and enjoying the space and building relationships. So we've really, I think, been able to evolve past the pure labor now to more of the relationship building and the event hosting on the site. And young agrarian staff coming to us as well, being key facilitators in that has been a real plus for us. So a little more background on the project here. This is Megan, as I was telling you about, our Indigenous apprentice, the Urban Aboriginal Voices. So the, the full property footprint is about four acres, but we were contained down to that, uh, that yellow dashed area, and it's about one and a half acres. And so we started the project in mid-June, 
in 2021. And that year we grew 500 pounds. In 2022, we started to expand our footprint to about two thirds of what you saw in that previous map and grew 1,250 pounds. And then with a the final footprint this year and our uh, young agrarians apprentices, we grew over 2,300 pounds. So overall, that's over 4,000 pounds of food. And where did it go? We donated it primarily to the mustard seed. The Red Deer Food Bank, our Indigenous elders and knowledge keepers, a few of whom you see in the picture there, and then some of the social programs for youth and those in need of food, like Street Ties and Helping Me Grow. So there's plenty more, but not enough slide space to fill it all in here. Uh, what we've done on site has been pretty impressive too, and we like to follow the permaculture principles and ethics as uh, Marcia had introduced us to. So around those three ethics are those 12 design principles and that's really given us a framework for how we're you know growing our site design from the original vision which kind of got uh, interrupted because of the soil reclamation to that smaller footprint so we had to think on our feet a little bit and that's where the permaculture principles come in and give us that direction how to do that most effectively without losing the original vision and capacity of what we were trying to accomplish so on the left, you can see our uh, elementary school from Oriole Park and their success in visiting our site on a weekly basis. They actually won the Queen's Jubilee Award in 2022, first place and third place. So with that $1,150 prize, they actually set up a garden at their own school and donated a couple hundred dollars back to the project and, and thanks for having those engagements on the weekly basis. And they came, I think, for two years in a row. So it's really great to see the successes and the changes in the students alone from being, you know, pent up in the classroom to getting to come down to the garden site every every week to kind of visit and really un unleash their energy and creativity. And that's what it resulted in. So trying to give the schools the opportunity to participate and, you know, grow along with us. Uh, we found a four season greenhouse that's unfortunately sitting in a sea can right now. But that's our goal is to be able to grow four seasons, so year round. And so we're uh, once that construction fence gets removed, we're looking forward to building, a again, an above ground structure that's easily movable. Uh, following the principle of zero waste on the bottom of that circle of permaculture principles, it's really driven, again, our design and what we've added to the site. So the picture of me pointing behind me, you can see the squash mound and the uh, repurposed uh, PVC piping. The bricks actually come from our water treatment plant, which are over 100 years old, because they just went through some recent renovations. So there's a big pile of them there that they told us, hey, do you guys want some bricks? So we figured this is a great opportunity to build some steps and to create thermal mass in the mound. So we create really good growing conditions for the plants. And if you Google squash mound, good luck finding any pictures. So it's a concept that one of our volunteers came up with who runs our own landscaping company. So we had to Put our heads together and come up with a design and it actually turned out really well with those growing tubs and the tiered nature of the of the uh, squash mound and on the bottom you can see our hoop house and our straw bale cold frame so again using reclaimed materials in the form of pallet wood and greenhouse plastic and really building in inexpensive season extending structures and you can see on the left those are sweet potatoes in the center of the picture so that's the first time i've ever had the chance to grow sweet potatoes and it was really interesting to uh, finally be able to do that and see what they look like in the soil and it's you know not what you see in the grocery stores it's definitely a scaled down version of those bigger herculean potatoes you find on the grocery store shelves but uh, we're working on it and we'll hopefully we'll get to do it again in 2024 and get a little bit better results so here is Young Agrarians, and we're so happy to have that relationship there and to provide employment for youth. And there's Megan showing off the medicine wheel garden, which started as a simple pile of soil that was just the leftovers from what the city donated to us. And because we had her join our team, she uh, took it upon herself to connect with her Indigenous elders and helped us do a lot of uh, public engagement programming. And this medicine wheel garden became like the focal point for those engagements. So the Indigenous elders and knowledge keepers would stand in the center of the circle with all the people seated around and were able to share their knowledge and uh, stories of the traditional medicines and the significance of the medicine wheel in their lives and how we can you know, incorporate that into our own lives and, and storytelling. And then you can see there Megan and Jenica with the earth loom, which was a, another uh, uh, idea shared to us from one of our volunteers. So that's a public art piece, essentially visitors to the site, kids predominantly can weave different pieces of grass and feathers and different things like that. And we can actually 
program it to have you know a different theme every year so that they have something to look forward to and contribute every time they visit the site. And then there's Miranda as our intern. She joined us halfway through the season from Slave Lake, and she was helping us with our community composting initiative, and that's some of the worm castings we have there that we are going to talk about in a little bit. But there's the quote at the bottom of the slide, great cities need great citizens. And then I added head in the clouds, hands in the ground, rooted in a sense of place. So we really want people to come to the site with ideas and energy, give them the opportunity to get their hands in the ground and reconnect with the land and really become knowledgeable about where they are and who they're working with and really, you know, uh, focus on those relationships and the opportunity to build them together. Building bridges between ideas and action. So we had, we had the chance to do our summer camp because the issue we were facing is that the kids would come in the spring when school's kind of wrapping up and then they go on summer vacation and some of them have a garden at home, some of them don't. So how do we bridge the gap between that school ending in the spring and then having the two months of perhaps no gardening and coming back in the summer. So that's where the idea of the summer camp came in. So we use permaculture principles to program a really good facilitated engagement. And we had three different nonprofits join us for our first year of summer camp. It was the African Caribbean Center of Central Alberta, the Red Deer Child Care Center, and then the Central Alberta Immigrant Women's Association. So I've highlighted here one of the better metaphors that we used in the uh, summer camp using the da Vinci bridge and the concept or the design principle of design from patterns to details. So we took paint sticks from the big box stores and basically uh, took a simple H pattern of two horizontal sticks and two vertical sticks, repeated that pattern and used da Vinci's idea of the bridge to show them how to put that together on the picnic table and then scale that idea up to pallet wood in the garden and then show them the real world examples. If you take a simple idea and start small and slow, you can build up to these, you know, world changing ideas, right? So the creek crossing there is a real simple one, but then you look to Norway, that's an actual wood bridge that's used for pedestrians crossing the street. So from really simple ideas, we're teaching kids that they can make a difference, they can change the world, but let's be practical about it and make changes as we go not trying to grow too big too quickly. And I think that's really been an impactful way to engage the kids at the site who maybe don't have any gardening experience and may feel overwhelmed in trying to take you know, this bigger concept of urban agriculture back home. So if you saw recently in the news, uh, December 5th was World Soil Day. So I put a few statistics or facts there about soil. And I think it's really important that we have this discussion about soil with regards to how do we address the issues of climate change in a positive energy and not as a doom and gloom situation. So I think getting your hands in the soil, those that have done it know that it's got a therapeutic effect. And I think it's really reality changing for a lot of people, right? Who've never gardened before. When you get your hands in the soil and grow something and actually get to taste it, it is literally life changing. And so that's what we're trying to share with people. So the idea that spawned from Common Ground is a project and looking at our setup and trying to really focus on that principle to produce no waste. So you can see here the concentric bale uh, beds empty at the end of the season. Some are degraded. You can see some of the straps breaking off and we're thinking, okay, well, what do we do? We can replace the straw bales, but where did the spent ones end up? And that's where the idea of the composting comes in. So we have an endless supply of carbon for our composting process and all we really needed was the space to actually do the composting because you can see in the upper picture there beside Jenica and Megan is the standard home scale version of composting the black tower which a lot of people get frustrated with because you have to stick a it's called a winged weeder all the way to the bottom and lift it up just to turn the pile so it's more of a static compost than active and it's so small that it takes really long to get any good results so through my education, through permaculture, we learned about the 19-day uh, or 20-day compost method. And so that's what inspired me to come up with this idea of the Great Canadian Compost Challenge. So supported by the City of Red Deer's Environmental Initiatives Grant, we got that uh, funding to set up the infrastructure to have the composting area and engage the community in this promotion and really inspire people to know that they can build soil in just 20 days. 
So to prepare for that, I learned about the uh, 131 schools uh, composting certificate program, and then it's supported by the book, Community Scale Composting Systems, written by James McSweeney. Highly recommend both the training, which they're doing a new intake right away here, as well as the book, which comes with the training, or you can buy it separately, but it really lays out the uh, home scale, scale up to any size commercial operation in very specific operational steps. So it's such a valuable resource and book to add to your library that I highly recommend it. So as I mentioned, the City of Red Deer has their environmental initiatives grant, which we secured. And to make sure we were doing things safely because we're under the public eye all the time, we wanted to make sure that we, we were, what we were doing was not going to create any issues of smell or um, pathogens and you know uh, nuisances essentially. So we contacted uh, Alberta Environment and Parks and Alberta Health Services to make sure that we're following any existing guidelines. But guess what? There's not a lot. And uh, with regards to composting at the community scale, they don't exist. So there's really a gap between the home scale and the commercial. And the biggest question we had is if we make all this compost, we only have so much growing space to apply it to, can we sell it? And that's where we learned that you actually have to have a license to sell compost. So we're basically piloting a model that will be able to work with local commercial businesses to divert organic waste because in Red Deer, we have a residential um, organics program, but there's nothing available for commercial businesses yet. And that's something that we're hoping that we can, you know, with this pilot project, inspire the city to establish and set up these community composting systems around the city at many of the community garden spaces and hopefully people's backyards as well that have the, the space to do it. So here's some of the um, materials that the grant paid for. So again, because we're on a brownfield site, the city required us to put a protective barrier between the growing space or anything that would potentially touch the soil and be ending up where the food is growing. So each of these is a 24 by 24 uh, concrete paver. And then in the upper right are cinder blocks made from hemp. So that was kind of cool to find those as a sustainable building product. So I actually drove to Edmonton with my trailer loaded up and brought those back as kind of a, an edge perimeter for uh, containing the, the composting area. So because none of us have done this before, we weren't sure exactly how big of a, of a base to build. So I started with the two pavers, 14 long or maybe 12 long, whatever's in this uh, picture, and realized after taking a shovel and pretending to turn the pile that you know there wasn't gonna be enough space. So we actually had to go a couple more times to get a few more. And you could consider this a boot camp of labor and exercise instead of going to the gym, ended up hauling 36 100 pound pavers to the site, plus all the cinder blocks. So it was definitely a, a free gym membership. And that's one of the added benefits of our project too, is if you uh, prefer working outdoors, this is a much better way than uh, being in a stuffy gym in, uh, in many instances. So uh, my recommendation here is many hands make light work and definitely put on a work bee. Uh, I didn't quite have the uh, uh, foresight to know that. And so I ended up having to schlep all those uh, pieces of concrete onto site, but it was worth it. And you can see the uh, building of the fence around it. And we use simple hardware cloth to uh, close it in just to give it a more, you know, obvious presence that this is a composting area. Um, we do have rodents on site. So the plan is to actually, you know, close it down to the ground. But right now it's kind of open just to see if the, the mice would actually be an issue. And so far there hasn't really been a big one. So you can kind of see the, uh, the layout there of it all. And really using simple um, ideas like a screw holding that piece of two by four, you just turn the two by four and it opens up that, uh, that gate. So don't have to go buy hinges or you know stuff that may be a little more expensive or out of budget. Uh, so we made what's called vegan compost because we didn't use any manure. We were again, concerned about the smell issue. And so we figured there's enough organics around that we can put a recipe together based upon the uh, spreadsheet calculator that the training provided. So Troubled Monk next door has a whole bunch of spent grains, spent brewer's grains. The Red Deer Food Bank has expired food because they get so many donations, it doesn't quite leave the uh, facility as fast as it maybe should. Uh, Dose Coffee and Cafe Vero provided us with spent coffee grains, or grinds, sorry, and tea bags. And as I mentioned earlier, the old straw bales. Uh, we have Wild Brewing Co. that brews kombucha. They have tea leaves and then an endless supply of old plant material. And it just so happened that when we were building the first pile, a magpie um, decided to expire right beside the composting area. So we use that as some of our 
nitrogen uh, addition to the center of the pile and considered it a, a sacrifice and contribution from from nature. So one of the sayings in permaculture is if you're doing good work, resources gather around you. So we saw that as a sign and decided to add the bird to the compost pile. So there's a picture of the, the layers of the organic material, uh, kind of a cake, and the uh, calendar there of the uh, schedule for setting it up and then waiting four days for everything to kind of uh, get settled and then turning the pile every second day to get the oxygen in there and constantly checking for moisture doing what's called the squeeze test. So you take a handful of the compost mix and if you get a few drops out, that's the perfect uh, moisture level. And this is technically called hot composting or thermophilic composting or the Berkeley method. So your recipe calls for 30 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. And again, that temperature, moisture and oxygen uh, triad there is what you're trying to follow. So there you can see Darcy and Jenica doing the turning and then the uh, compost text fabric is used kind of like a uh, cortex. So it keeps the moisture out, but allows the pile to breathe still. So the issue there is that if it rains, you can't control it very well and the pile may become oversaturated and, and anaerobic. So to make sure that we're maintaining good conditions in the pile, we, we protected it with that compost text fabric. And there's our three foot temperature probe. I actually have it in the office here by the door. It's you know pretty long. It goes right to the base of the pile and there you can see Jenica showing off that we're in the zone. So for safety's sake, we need to get that uh, pile temperature up over 131 Fahrenheit, and that's where the name of the school comes in, of 131 degrees or 55 Celsius. And the reason is, is so that any harmful pathogens that may be in that organic pile are neutralized or made inert. And the reason the pile gets hot is because the microbes are reproducing at such a high volume. So when we contrast this pile with the uh, Black Tower unit, this pile is a minimum of a cubic meter, whereas that black box tends to be a lot less. So if you are going anything less than a cubic meter, it's very, very hard, if not impossible, to get it up to that temperature for long enough to make the compost safe uh, for food growing anyways. Oh, and we used a uh, FLIR camera. It's a little addition you just plug into your smartphone and you can uh, you know, take shots like that and video and it's pretty cool to kind of be able to show that off uh, to our volunteers and to our uh, social media followers. So you can uh, take that little crosshair and, you know, compare body heat to the pile heat. And even in the middle of our first snowfall, you'll see that coming up here, how warm the pile was or what the result was. So as the pile finished after the 20 days, we wanted to see in what shape it's actually in. So we hired uh, Jennifer from Flowing Springs Permaculture and Soil Health, who's done the uh, soil food web training with Dr. Elaine Ingham to test our samples for us. She actually came into our site, into our boardroom here and kind of walked us through the process and showed us under the microscope what's going on. So she found a lot of cool things and that's where the excited expression comes in. But it was really neat to kind of see, you know, adult summer camp in contrast to the kids summer camp. So we're looking forward now to taking what we've learned through these uh, science experiments and, you know, uh, making mistakes and teaching the kids now how to do it properly. And hopefully they can set it up at their schools as well. So while we were waiting for the test results to come back, we went ahead and just started to brew some compost extract because I've done this in the past before and figured it's a great uh, learning opportunity for our volunteers. So we used a half horsepower Sweetwater blower, a thousand liter IBC tote, and then a gas or electric generator. And you put them all together. It creates basically a hot tub type condition. So a lot of air is pumping through that hose. And then you can see the uh, final product of the <laughs> compost tea extract and that's all the sediment in the bottom there of the uh, of the IBC tote with the spent uh, tea bag. So the difference here between an extract and a tea is that the brewing time is longer and you put different ingredients in. So for ours it was simply just to use some of our leftover materials and get that extract and apply it to the garden space. So as that all got wrapped up, then our biological report came in and so we did not too bad. Um, more bacterial than fungal, but for uh, annual garden like we have, that's kind of ideal. So here it kind of shows you in the bottom table, the balance between the fungus and the bacteria in your compost pile and what will be better for different growing conditions. So we're really aiming for the left-hand side, the root crops and the annual veggies. So really you're looking for a higher uh, bacteria population than fungal population. But this in itself is, is weeks of training 
And that's why we hired Jennifer to help us to make sure that what we were creating was going to be safe. So with that knowledge and the feedback that we actually did well, we started pile number two and we started naming the pile. And so the <laughs> volunteers decided compost Malone. And we took a pineapple and threw it on top there for uh, shits and giggles. And that uh, didn't last very long. As soon as the pile turned once or twice, the pineapple had disappeared, much like the, uh, the magpie disappeared in the first pile. So you can see them collecting all the food from the food bank and trying to make that recipe as best as possible. And then we took advantage of having the finished pile from pile one and use some of that to inoculate pile two because you really want those bacteria that are the end result working at the front end too. So that helped us speed up the processing of our second pile, which you can kind of see in the, uh, the cage. And the cage is another big uh, uh, recommendation is turning it by hand. It's hard to keep that pile even, but when you put the cage around it, it helps contain everything and make sure that the uh, heat is evenly spread through the whole pile. And that's why we turn it as well, is to make sure that the outside gets to the inside and the inside gets to the outside for complete processing. And then it's just the same process again. Follow the schedule, make sure your recipe is correct. And you can see even with the big snow dump we had in October, the whole top of the pile melted off. So it was still active inside over 131 degrees in spite of all the cold around it. And there's Lindsay celebrating that we finished pile number two. We call her the queen of compost with the scepter there. That's the three foot uh, temperature probe that we recommend you use. Uh, and now, you know, moving indoors, we asked our volunteers, do you want to keep doing this out in the cold? And they're like, no, well, what, what else can we do? And so that's where the worm composting comes in. So in the upper left, you can see our worm factory, big green worm bin. And then we just bought this new worm hotel, which has the frame and gets uh, constructed as you see there. And we got in touch with Rhonda Sherman, who wrote the book, The Worm Farmer's Handbook. So we're looking forward to a couple of vermicomposting workshops with her online. So if you're interested in that, stay in touch and we'll let you know when they're happening. And again, back to the idea of building bridges. So Da Vinci really inspired that idea. And we're trying to use that as a means to you know, educate people as they come to the site. This is a process. This is a journey. You're trying to get from here to there, and it doesn't happen overnight. And so if we can use the permaculture principles and stay true to the ethics, we can really be comfortable in coming to events like our Eco Living Fair, where it's kind of like a, a family reunion without the fighting, I like to call it. And then that's, again, where we can start to really work with our youth through a structured program like Young Agrarians offers and give them the... the employment skills that they're really going to need to succeed in the world of regenerative agriculture and that transition in how to work with the soil and really address climate change in a positive way. And my final slide here is um, your mosaic. And really, this is the message we're trying to tell people is that you don't have to conform to one person's vision or what you may think that everybody has to, you know, align with a particular way of doing things. The principles guide us, the ethics give us the confidence that what we're doing is for the benefit of everybody. And that this picture of a horse is supported in every single panel that makes up the horse picture. So every one of those panels actually is an individual representation of a horse or a horse themed image. And if we use and value those renewable resources and services, including inspiring and sharing ideas, it's much easier for people to feel like they can be part of the project, but come at it with their own ideas and imagination and hopefully inspire others and then we each take those ideas back home to where we live we build a really strong community and network and we're helping generate the new uh, workforce through practical skills and supported by those relationships so that's my contact info there um, super excited to take us into 2024 and uh, triple hopefully our young agrarian apprentices and get them involved in the business boot camp and really, uh, you know, welcome people to the site for tours and visits, but also looking at the opportunity to replicate the model around our city and in other communities, because nothing we've done is really specific to our community. It's just working with the same components, kind of like a Lego set. You just introduce people to the Lego and they have fun building things. So thank you for entertaining me today. Well, thank you so much, Renee. Uh, that's uh, uh, what a fantastic uh, uh, initiative and and project you have going on there in Red Deer. Um, let's uh, let's open it up here from the the, the group here with any questions. Uh, 
I have a, a couple of questions. Um, the first one is about um, the year round uh, greenhouse. Um, that really, really um, inspires me that, that year round um, growing season in, in our climate. Um, can you share just a little bit more information about what that looks like? Like how you're, how you're powering that because you have that like zero waste um, perspective. So what does that look like? Mm -hmm. So it's not a common thing around here because we're so reliant on natural gas to keep our greenhouses warm. But um, the University of Minnesota is pioneering the deep winter greenhouse concept. And so it's building very insulated north, east and west walls with south facing glazing. And if we can build other structures onto that, it just gives more buffer to get through the colder times. One of the technologies that's available is called a climate battery. So we'd actually use the soil underground, pass air through it through perforated tubes or weeping tile and use that thermal mass in addition to the concrete and other uh, water tanks and things like that we can put into the greenhouse to hold on to that heat when the sun is shining so that when the sun goes down, it helps buffer the transition uh, or sorry, the temperature change. Um, and really we don't have to do much more than keep it from freezing. So that doesn't take too much fossil fuel. We're just so conditioned with our greenhouses to grow all the heat loving plants, but there's all kinds of uh, winter greens that we can grow. And I just actually got the book from Jean-Martin Fortier and his uh, farm in Quebec. And he's pioneering that, that winter growing, which used to be commonplace in places like France and even around here. But then we've become so uh, like I say, conditioned to using the fossil fuels ubiquitously that we've forgotten that we can actually grow lots of different things and live more seasonably in how we consume food. Thank you for that. No, it's, that's, I'm really looking forward to hearing more um, as you guys evolve with that, but that's, that's so great. Um, and then my last question is, um, again, tied to that municipal piece, um, because there are some municipalities that, you know, maybe don't see food security or, or food sovereignty as part of their role um, in that ecosystem. And so I think that um, the Rethink Red Deer and the work that you're doing is an incredible um, model for municipalities to be looking at and, and seeing their role in this space. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could share a little bit more about like the in inception of that, how it stemmed through the municipality. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be great. It's it's really good to have champions within the city as well that understand these ideas. And so one of our key champions is Ken Lehman with the Parks Department, and he's actually taken that permaculture training as well. So it's it's almost like a rite of passage to uh, you know see the the community in a connected way and how. You know, we integrate the different aspects of our designs in both the uh, public and private and nonprofit settings. So um, with people like that uh, helping to, you know, spread the message internally and explain, you know, when they're on site to their coworkers and other visitors, it's not just falling on one person being the linchpin for the entire, you know, sharing of information. So I think it's that's one big aspect of it is, you know, encouraging the city staff as well to become familiar with the design principles and the ethics. Um, but also we've been around long enough that, you know, we're not going anywhere and we're, you know, committed to the vision of a sustainable community. And then it's working with the municipality and their council um, to, you know, actualize the plans that they create. So, for example, we have an environmental master plan, which has a, has a lot of sub uh, goals in it. So we can, you know, get behind those initiatives and not just have them gathering dust on the shelf or left in the hands completely of the municipality. That's what citizenship is about. It's being connected with your place, with your people, knowing what the, the government's responsible for, but limited in their capacity and resources of what they can do, because obviously we want to keep our taxes low. So we can't expect the municipality to have to do everything. And I think that's where citizenship comes in, is if people can grow beyond the idea of being a consumer to being an active citizen and what that means. It's, you know, just reapportioning your own hours in the day to those things that make the biggest impact. But until you know how to make that impact, it's hard to do that economy for yourself. So I think with projects like Common Ground, it's a place that people can come to, see the examples of how these systems are put together but again, like the mural mosaic, they get to take their piece of that horse image back home and make their own mosaic with the people that they build relationships with. 
Yeah, no, that's that's really well put. And I, I liked that connection that you made, the great cities and, and great citizens with that quote that you opened with. I, I really, um, that resonated for sure. Thanks. Um, Danielle, I see your hand is up. Um, yeah, I that's a great project. And I think you're absolutely right that we need to have our citizens more engaged and realized that their engagement does make these communities stronger because without that, governments can only do so much. And you're right about the tax, it costs money and or effort. Um, my question though, kind of goes back to your greenhouse idea. And I was wondering if it had crossed your mind or if it is possible to use the heat that's generated from your compost piles to heat your greenhouse as well, mm -hmm. to add that extra layer of uh, thermal energy in the winter. Yeah, very astute, very, very good idea. Uh, actually, Will Allen in uh, Milwaukee was doing that with growing power. So it's just getting to that level of uh, volunteer and staffing so we can actually, you know, stick to the schedule and not fall behind and have it kind of collapse a little bit. But I think with those bigger piles, that's where it's more of a static compost. And uh, because you have the volume there, it's still going to be generating the heat. So it's a great idea. It's just being able to build a, a greenhouse large enough to provide for that composting area while you still have uh, space for the plants to grow. But yeah, it's a great idea. Are there any other questions for Renee? Um, so uh, something has happened um, with Derek's internet. So he has, uh, he's been kicked off. He's trying to get back on, but um, so if there's if there's no other questions, um, I would just like to wrap up and um, thank Derek for um, co-hosting this with me and also Marsha and Renee, thank you so much. Um, there's so much that we have to learn from you and, and from your um, experiences. Um, I'm really happy to see um, that our, our funder um, is available on this call as well. So um, Resilient Rurals and, and this webinar series and some of the uh, food sovereignty work that we're doing um, is supported by the Municipal Climate Change Action Center. Um, and so very, very grateful. Um, the center has been incredible to work with. Um, really have uh, been very grateful for the, the support and the relationship that they have uh, built with us. So I'm gonna pop into the chat a link to that funding, but I'm just gonna open it up um, to Andrea Miller. She's, she's with uh, the funder, so she wanted to just share a couple of words. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Andrea. I do apologize for having my camera off. I'm feeling a bit under the weather. Um, thanks Jill for that kind introduction and thanks to you and Derek and the rest of the Resilient Rules team on the call for hosting the event. It's nice to see um, some familiar faces. Uh, thanks to the speakers for your presentations. Yeah, so I'm a project associate with Alberta Municipalities and the Municipal Climate Change Action Center. Also joining you today from Treaty 6 territory uh, from a very frosty uh, Beaver Hills house. Um, so as an organization, MCCAC provides funding, we provide education, technical assistance to municipalities, Indigenous communities, and community organizations to support uh, everything from energy efficiency to climate resilience work. So together with my colleague, Ronik Patel, we administer the Climate Resilience Capacity Building Program, which is a program funded by the Government of Alberta, where we provide grant funding to support municipalities and Indigenous communities to progress on climate adaptation planning and building community and regional resilience. So we've been really happy to get to know the Resilient Rurals team and provide funding to support some of this work. Um, and it's been great to see this collaborative partnership progress over the last year and, and just to see this regional approach to climate resilience um, in action. It's such an important and relational approach. So um, yeah, really happy to, uh, to be invited and happy to be there, uh, be here. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Andrea. 
Um, and so just as, as a quick wrap up, um, I'm also going to throw in the chat um, some information. So our next uh, webinar will be December 14th at 10 a.m. Um, we'll be joined by Tim Carson. He's the CEO of the Alberta Association of Agricultural Societies. Some, some really interesting information uh, with him. So looking forward to that as well. Um, and again, thank you so much to the speakers and for everyone that joined. Um, we'll send out the recording. So if you have anybody that you um, can share this with that you feel would benefit from, um, that would be really great. And um, I see Derek has been able to pop back on. So I'll just uh, maybe leave the closing words to, to Derek. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, sorry about that. Uh, the, so the hotel I'm at is like kicking me out. So they're saying like... Uh, <laughs> shut my internet off. <laughs> uh, but hi, hi. Uh, thank you so much for everybody uh, for, for participating and joining us today on this very important topic of, you know, food sovereignty. Um, you know, I know that's a, that's a big word, but, uh, you know, in my travels throughout this country, um, you know, it's something that communities are very interested in. And, and the sharing of knowledge is, is, is a big part of that. And as from a First Nation perspective, you know, we're so happy that we are um, engage in these conversations with everybody and so uh, you know in my mind this is the ultimate form of reconciliation in this country is when people come together you know on the on the front lines at the grassroots level um, to uh, to try to tackle some of these uh, challenging topics so uh, I wish you all a fantastic weekend and, uh, and and fantastic holidays I hope each and every one of your home fires burns bright hi hi thank you